What's going on guys? This is Rob and it's snowing here in Lexington, the worst snow that we've had in over 10 years. So if you guys are like me and you're stuck in your homes, I figured I would do the best I could to make this day a little more bearable by answering the question a lot of people have. If Disney has bought the Star Wars franchise, then where do we go from here? So, following Disney purchasing the rights to Star Wars, the question that a lot of people had is, where do you go from here? Where do you start? If you're interested in reading the expanded universe of Star Wars, should you even bother reading it in the first place? So what we're going to do is we're going to answer this question. When the, I guess, Return of the Jedi came out, the chronologically last of the Star Wars films, what we know is that this huge expanded universe began to unfold even more so than it had before. And the reason I say that is because after episode, or I guess episode four, after A New Hope, which again was first the first a Star Wars film that had been released to us, it really caught people. People loved the idea of Star Wars, and so all these different novels began to spout up. We saw novels based on the origins of, uh, of Han Solo. We saw novels based on the life of Princess Leia leading up to her appearance in uh, Star Wars A New Hope. But the problem here was that Disney was faced with this almost insurmountable situation. Because there were so many expanded universe novels, a majority of which were basically based on the events that took place after the, uh, the, the Return of the Jedi, and because they wanted to bring back Star Wars films and to expand on the universe through the films after Return of the Jedi, they had to make a choice. The choice being, which one do they choose? Do they make their films based on the expanded universe or do they create something separate? And so what they decided to do was create something entirely different. And so as a result, much to the chagrin of Star Wars fans, they basically wiped the entire expanded universe. And so what they said is that anything that is not part of the original six films that have been released so far, that is to say episodes one, two, three, four, five, and six, or the, uh, the, the Star Wars Clone Wars cartoon show. Anything that's not part of that is not considered official. And this made comic book fans and Marvel fans, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Star Wars fans, so angry. And the reason why I say comic fans is because for the longest time, Dark Horse Comics had been publishing Star Wars comics. They've been basically giving us the comic book arm of the Star Wars stories that took place in the expanded universe, some of which were tie-ins to the films, different things that had gone on. And so when we saw Disney finally took things over, they had taken the Star Wars franchise away from Marvel, I'm sorry, away from Dark Horse, and they had given it to Marvel Comics. Now, this leads us into Marvel Comics launching uh, Star Wars issue number one. Now, Star Wars issue number one picks up immediately after the events of, uh, of Star Wars A New Hope. And the reason why is because if you guys recall with Star Wars A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, all we had known was that at the end of, the, uh, at the end of A New Hope, that Luke Skywalker had blown up the Death Star. And then we immediately pick up with uh, The Empire strikes back and they're on Hoth. The question was, how did we get to those two places? What transpired between Star Wars A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back that bridges the gap between those two worlds? This is what Star Wars issue number one and the subsequent stories do. And so what we find is that The Empire has basically reached out to Jabba the Hutt with the intention of having Jabba the Hutt become a weapon supplier for the Empire. But the goal here is to have these weapons supplied out of one of the biggest weapon depots uh, that is known to exist. And so what's going to take place is that the Empire is going to send a negotiator of their own and that this no negotiator is going to meet with an emissary of Jabba the Hutt. And so what we find is that when this emissary arrives at the, uh, the weapons depot to meet with the weapons depot overseer, who of course again works for the Empire, we find that we're greeting with, I guess we're meeting with uh, with Han Solo. Now, this is a passable thing as far as the Overseer is concerned, and the reason why is because the relationship between Han Solo and Jabba the Hutt is well known, and so the Rebel Alliance is basically using this as a way to effectively convince everybody that they're emissaries. Now, we also find that um, that Han Solo is accompanied by uh, Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker, who are both disguised, along with uh, R2-D2. What we also find here is that Chewbacca is overseeing this entire thing, not in the sense that a manager capacity, but in the sense that he's basically their eyes in the sky. He is with the at the, at the Millennium Falcon alongside C-3PO, and that he's operating as a sniper to ensure their protection in case things were to pop off. And so what happens is that with uh, Han Solo and uh, Princess Leia and uh, Luke Skywalker continuing to pretend to be emissaries, that once they actually arrive to a conference room where they're being held, they immediately tell this uh, this overseer to tell them where the, uh, I guess, where the power core is for this facility with their intention of destroying it. Now, the overseer 
Peter doesn't initially want to reveal this to him, but once he, uh, I guess once he's threatened by uh, R2-D2 with electrocution, the Overseer tells him, or I guess points him in the direction of where it's at. But along the way, we also see that Luke Skywalker is continuing to learn how to use his Jedi powers, that he's continuing to, continuing to learn how to step into the role of being a Jedi. Because again, to keep in mind here, Luke Skywalker has not met Yoda. And so the only real training Luke Skywalker has is a little experience he gained from uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and whatever else it happens to be that he learns along the way. And so one of the things that Luke Skywalker stumbles across here is a holding pin, a pin with uh, various, um, I guess, Empire slaves. And so what he does is he cuts off the arm of, uh, of the guard after failing to use a Jedi mind trick and then frees the rest of the slaves. But what we also learn is that the negotiator that's been sent by the Empire is Darth Vader. And so what's going on here is that they're in a situation whereby if Chewbacca were to shoot Darth Vader, then it would put the entire base on alert, which uh, Han Solo tells him not to do. But because Princess Leia is effectively the one running the show here, because she is, as far as a military standpoint, the highest ranking person here, as far as the Rebel Alliance goes, she tells Chewbacca to shoot Darth Vader. And when that happens, the uh, of course, the Darth Vader is able to deflect the, uh, the the blaster bolt. And so as a result, the entire base is now put on alert, leading the, uh, the members of the Rebel group to scramble and to get out of there as fast as they can. But again, this really just sort of sets the stage for things as we uh, as we progress with these Star Wars stories. Again, this is just issue number one. And so what we'll find is things progress with regards to this whole Star Wars thing. And so we'll ultimately lead up to a set of circumstances where we'll again continue to see these holes filled in. We'll continue to see these things uh, built on and to build up into something spectacular. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know. And I will catch you guys later. Peace. Be sure to follow me on Twitter. There you can keep up with all the updates from Comics Explained and talk to me directly.